we went to the prophets uh, out of uh, studying Abraham <clears throat> with purpose, with, with, with purpose. And uh, there were two main things that we wanted to glean from that um, was that we wanted to, we wanted to examine um, <clears throat> the um, situation with Israel or with Judah <clears throat> being um, uh, talked to through Jeremiah and Ezekiel, which we'll get into some of that, uh, that God's plan for them was that uh, they would submit to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. And if they do that, they would remain in their land, but they, they rebelled against that. <clears throat> And so God basically, well, he did, sent them into captivity and wiped out the ones that, you know, fought against him um, because he called um, Nebuchadnezzar his hand and his servant. <clears throat> and um, to begin to see, <coughs> excuse me, to begin to see um, an aspect of the sufferings of Christ. <clears throat> and... Um, you know we're 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 in that here. You see you see that in the book of Esther where <clears throat> they were going along pretty good, and Esther got raised up to be a queen, and then all of a sudden God opens the door to Haman, which is the equivalent of Nebuchadnezzar, which is the equivalent of every evil doer that that comes along, according to the book of First Peter, and it just wreaks havoc and makes all kind of problems. <clears throat> um, but God's goal was to get them into a certain spirit. <clears throat> and the one who didn't have that spirit was the one was Mordecai, who regularly rebelled against the king's commandment. And since most people are not familiar with that aspect, you should go back and read, read that <clears throat> because he does. And, uh, and it's the king that he's rebelling against, just like Judah is rebelling against God, not just Babylon. And uh, let's see, <clears throat> we, we've, we've got that in this class. What other class am I teaching? I don't know. Anyway, so there's, it's, it's really, it was there in, uh, when we looked in um, Exodus and chapter 12 and Pharaoh and all of that. <clears throat> it's an ongoing thing throughout the scripture. It's a very common thing. And it's the, it's that the Lord is trying to form this nature, this lamb nature in us. Um, now, let me say this. I mean, there's so much to say, my Lord. But let me just say this. <clears throat> and that is that um, uh, God, in many places in the scripture, would come to the rescue of the poor of the needy. He would do that. He does that. Um, but that was different than trying to bring some into the corridor of sufferings where they would fellowship with him as according to Philippians and all of first Peter <clears throat> fellowship with him in this spirit. And so that's, that's been a huge part of what we've been dealing with so far in Jeremiah. And we'll yet see it in Ezekiel, and then we'll go back to Abraham. But um, so last class, we were in Jeremiah 46. And in, in Jeremiah 46, we actually, um, let's see if I can. <clears throat> we actually, last class, we actually introduced this other aspect of Adonai that I've been talking about, which was our second reason for going to to hear from um, Abraham and his encounter with Adonai. This has also been an encounter with Adonai. And last class, <clears throat> we, um, we brought it forth. Um, we spelled it out, but I didn't point it out. I didn't point it out. I did point out the important points. Um, 
but I didn't point that out. Um, so tonight we're going to get into those. Those we're going to get into that aspect, that second part that we've been needing to get into, <clears throat> and um, and you can see if you grasp it. And my, and my reason for for spelling it out and really pointing out the main things, but not just going. Now this is <clears throat> is for us to you know sharpen our our hearing and to be able to catch it from the scriptures because that's all I was doing is just reading portions in a certain way that you could go hmm wait a minute <clears throat> tonight we're gonna point it out we're gonna get get to it <laughs> okay but first chapter 46 Jeremiah the first words of that is the word of the Lord which came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Gentiles <clears throat> against Egypt and against the army okay that's important this isn't an attack because of their idols their idols are going down too and and that may be truths in other areas but not when it gets to this area God is a has something very specific that he's upset with Egypt about <clears throat> okay and so and then verse uh, 3 through 6 remember it starts talking about all these all this strength the buckler and the shield and the horses and the horsemen and they're mighty ones and they're called mighty ones and of course he ends verse 6 by saying well your mighty ones are gonna run and they're gonna stumble and they're gonna fall because God is really serious about this aspect of Adonai that if we if we ignore and we turn our backs on <clears throat> it's it's you know like all the other aspects are so wonderful um, but we need to know we need to know him in all sides you know uh, what did Job say shall I uh, receive good from the hand of the Lord and not receive bad so <clears throat> um, and then um, so then verse 7 and 8 he starts talking about <clears throat> the Egypt you're gonna rise you, you you think you're gonna rise like a flood and you're gonna go up and you're gonna cover the earth and you're gonna you know do all of this <clears throat> And th this is not God simply upset with somebody who's uh, full of themselves and proud and pomp and all this kind of stuff. That's mixed in there too, but that's not the real issue either. Okay, so um, so uh, verses nine and ten. <clears throat> well, let's go to verse ten, and this is Jeremiah forty six ten. And this was a very important part here. For this is the day of the Lord God, and the word Lord is Adonai. This is the day of, the, of Adonai God of hosts, a day of vengeance. Now, you don't, you don't hear the word vengeance mixed in with... Um, um, uh, with the working of Adonai hardly at all but then some of you remember the chart that we used in um, first Peter and we had the evildoer here and I guess I could have just done what I did I painted a little evil looking thing here and then you or me or whoever and then he brings this thing down on us this crisis this 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 uh, uh, judgment, this ac accusations, false accusations, and all of the things that would just um, break us down. And he does it publicly, and he shames, you know, all these things that start happening. And we see it as a crisis. We just see it as a crisis. Well, then we were sort of missing the point. But what we kind of talked about was that there was a early stage of what we call the corridor of sufferings an early stage where you kind of have to get it together and figure out okay because is this is this truly an attack of the devil is this um is this uh, something else or is this um god <clears throat> trying to bring me into the image of his son in relationship to fellowshipping with him in the sufferings of Christ all right and so um, so uh, then you get into you, you know as you recognize what it is you get into the 
the corridor, you get into the, that area and you go through that with a certain spirit that glorifies God. And it's the spirit of his son. It's the spirit of the lamb. And then there's a resurrection at the end of that. <clears throat> well, we're talking about that right now. So, so listen to what these verses are saying. <clears throat> Verse 10 again. For this is the day of the Adonai's uh, God of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge him of his adversaries. So this is not dealing with your adversary now. And you could say, if you will, you could say that your adversary is the evildoer and he's not dealing with that. And this is an avenge, a vengeance towards them. It's something else. It's something else. And it's something <clears throat> when you start getting into this corridor. And so I'll point it out in just a second, but let's finish reading this. <clears throat> um, that he may avenge him of his adversaries. And the sword shall devour, and it shall uh, be sati satiated. Uh, it shall satiate and made drunk with their blood for the Lord, which is Adonai, again, um, in the same verse, <clears throat> the Lord God of hosts hath a sacrifice in the north country by the Euphrates River. So he's going, you're going to, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be really bad. <clears throat> All right. So my note said, uh, I don't know why my hair is bugging me on my ear, but it is. This is Adonai speaking above. And I read, you, I read this to you last time. <clears throat> this is Adonai. Okay, this is why we came here on, on the second point. This is Adonai speaking above. It is not a day of vengeance for what Egypt did to Babylon. It is not a day of vengeance of what Egypt did did to Judah. It's their offense against God in relationship to this whole thing. <clears throat> and specifically, it's, a, it's what they did to Adonai. All right. So, <clears throat> um, so in, uh, verse 11 and 12 is the same stuff. You know, it's, you, you can try your medicines and all this, but it's, you're going to fall and it's going to be bad and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> okay. And then uh, verse uh, 20 through 21 is, uh, again, saying, you know, you're like this great thing, you know, a, a, a fair heifer. And, uh, and it mentions their hired men, which they've mentioned up before that. <clears throat> um, and they are all turned back and are all fled away together. They did not stand because the day of their calamity was come upon them and the time of their visitation. All right. So um, <clears throat> we know that the primary purpose of Jeremiah and Ezekiel <clears throat> is about, about the captivity and is about mm -hmm this this uh <clears throat> rebellion and again it's it's not just a rebellion against babylon which is the evildoer in this case it's not just or 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 pharaoh way way back which this is not dealing with that story either in egypt um or um <clears throat> or uh haman uh, in the book of Esther, or in so many places. I'm sorry, I can't, rem I'm not just recalling it right now, but there's so many examples of this in the Bible. <clears throat> um, it is, um, it's, it's not the fact that they wouldn't, wouldn't bow down to God or to Babylon. Um, let's see if I wrote something here. So the, the issue is not merely God and Judah, though that's what the primary thing is in the book. But here it's between God and Egypt. Okay. And it, notice in verse one there against his army. Okay. So what's going on? 
I mean, come on, pull it out, see it. It's, it's, it's not this and it's not, you know, but it's something that is not pictured here yet that we have talked about, but we never addressed it like this because frankly, I didn't see it like this until the Lord began to open my eyes. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, Okay, so let's go to verse 24. And uh, let's see. Yeah, so now we're going to get into it. So, so pay attention. Try to catch this, okay? Try to catch it without me saying it. Verse 24, The daughter of Egypt shall be confounded. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north, which is Babylon. The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel saith, Behold, I will punish the multitude of no, and that's just the, this greater portion of Egypt and the Lydians and all these guys, <clears throat> um, and Pharaoh and Egypt. And I will deliver them into the hand of those that seek their lives, and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his servants, and afterwards it shall be inhabited at, um, as in the days of old, saith the Lord. <clears throat> so, let's see what I say here. Here we're made aware that all this comes about as punishment. God, in the midst of all that Babylon is doing, in the midst of all that Judah is doing, God, not just here, not just in this chapter. We've been, we went through it, and I would... I, when we would touch on Egypt, I would always say something, trying to get a red flag going. And Ezekiel is going to be so clear. This is setting it up. Ezekiel is going to be so clear along these lines. So this is just a prelude. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, here... Here we're made aware uh, that all this comes about as punishment. You punish someone because of something specific, right? So that's so the specific thing. This is the heart of it. This is the heart of it. Jeremiah is not really as good in describing the reason for God's great anger in Egypt and all who joined with them as much as Ezekiel will be. But we do gain a clue from verses 27 and 28. Let's read them. <clears throat> but fear thou, but, but, but fear not thou, O my servant Jacob. Be not dismayed, O Israel. For behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear not. Uh, fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee. For I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. Okay, the question arises then. This is almost the end of of Jeremiah, book of Jeremiah. This is almost the end of it, and um, uh, and God is every once in a while He'll say something about, well, I I will bring you back. I will, you know, every once in a while He does that. But here He's going after the juggler vein of Egypt, and then He says this. It's right there. I feel like I got a rod and I'm casting it out it's right there. Catch the bait, catch the bait. All right. <clears throat> so you ready? Because I'm just going to read. Um, this is it. <clears throat> Up to this point in the book of Jeremiah, it seems that God is primarily dealing with his own people, but also sets forth prophe prophecies against other foreign nations because he doesn't like what they are doing on the side, particularly we're talking about Egypt. <clears throat> At times it almost seemed random how his words to them are brought into the picture. 
but this is not the case at all. They are very strategically applied to the overall problem. In verses 27 and 28, he starts with the word but. So that's but fear not. Okay, <clears throat> But it is a conjunction tying what is below, meaning these words, I will save you, da, 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 with what he's talking about Egypt. Um, it is a conjunction tying what is below with what went before. What went before was Egypt coming with all its might and power, and what is being said after is Judah. So this is the, what's, what comes after. Judah, don't fear, for I will save you. The most obvious conclusion we might come to, unless we've studied Ezekiel, would be that God would save Judah from Egypt. However, the gist of this and the book of Jeremiah is not concerning problems with Egypt, the gist, the main gist of the book. <clears throat> um, but with Judah not submitting to Babylon. And we know that the greater issue is not a lack of submission to Babylon first, but first to submit to God in this. So why is he so angry with Egypt? and expresses it to extreme measure in both Jeremiah and Ezekiel. All right, so we're going to read those verses again, verse 27, 28, and then we're going to go ahead and just, just say it. <clears throat> but fear, fear not thou, O my servant, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off in thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee, for I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure, yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. Okay, here we go. You ready? Fasten your seatbelts. <clears throat> This sounds like God, Adonai, may be angry at Egypt for one main reason. God is going to use Babylon as his tool. Right? We've, we've studied that. God is going to use Babylon <clears throat> as his tool concerning the sufferings of Christ. But Judah, because of their ignorance as to how God works as an Adonai in the corridor of suffering, is going to call on Egypt to come help them get out of the corridor. This is, uh, right now, the only word I'm going to use, I guess, because that's the way we would see it. This is not evildoers bringing the crisis over here. <clears throat> this is, that would maybe drive you into the corridor of sufferings. This is helpers outside that are probably your friends, your compadres, the people that you look to to come and start ministering to you and, and uh, uh, circumventing what Adonai's place is. <clears throat> All right. So, um, Judah resists and violates God's holy work of gaining and hearing, uh, bearing his image, which is brought about by suffering. In what way does Judah resist? They do so just, I mean, this is the same way that, that we resist. In what way does they do so by the process of seeking out outside help to alleviate or remove the pain, stigma, and disgrace that make up Christ's sufferings. This is somebody that comes and says, oh, you poor thing, and you tell them all of the things that, that people, that, that the evil do, or, you know, man, this is just a vicious cycle here, isn't it? It's just a vicious cycle. You, you start bad-mouthing the evildoers now instead of laying down your life and, and leaving that to Adonai. And so you start 
building this case with your helpers and your, your the people that and we talked about this in first peter class and and other areas <clears throat> you start you you have to have somebody to relieve uh, i have to relieve the pressure you know um and so you you literally are going against your adonai see it's so funny because we've got all these people in here i mean here's adonai who is supposed to be over this whole process working something in you of christ crucified of the lamb and um you've got uh, but but then you get into the hot the hot of the fire, if you will, the heat of the fire, and you start resorting to Egyptians to come help you. You start calling on something else, someone that will give you a pity party or some something that will you can you can uh, get on your side. Well, they're evil, they're evil, and all this, and that's the exact opposite of what Jesus did when he hung on the cross. That's the exact opposite of the sufferings of Christ who opened not his mouth. So, let's read on a little more. <clears throat> Let me just read that last part again. Um, well, this uh, God is going to use Babylon as his tool concerning the sufferings of Christ, but Judah, because of their ignorance as to how God works as an Adonai in the quarter of sufferings, is going to call on Egypt to help them get out of it or to, to soothe their flesh enough that they will, you know, but, but not form Christ. We very seldom bring somebody in that will form Christ. And you shouldn't bring anybody in anyway. Just open not your mouth and be with the Lord in that spirit. And it's that spirit that he wants. So that voids the whole thing out. And then it's just a stench instead of a sweet savor. <clears throat> um, Judah resists and violates God's holy work of gaining and bearing his image, which is brought about by suffering. In what way does Judah resist? They do so by the process of seeking out outside help to relieve or remove the suffering or the pain of the suffering or the stigma or the disgrace that make up Christ's sufferings. It would be the same as if when in the corridor we run to get people on our side, to get people to pet our flesh, to get people to fight for us or fight against that which God has brought us to so that we could depend on our Adonai. See, we just think it's a it's a thing we're just in there alone, but we're not. This is this is not your territory, it's Adonai's territory. And when you get in there, you belong to him. And you're supposed to be under his umbrella. You're supposed to um uh all the things that we've discussed, all the good parts that we've discussed, but it also means there's a negative part and this whole thing with Egypt really rankled God. It really did. But it didn't just rankle God. You notice up there where we started reading where it did, it started using the name Adonai. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, in Adonai's mind, <laughs> okay, so there's another mind working here. Well, we got a, the mind of the evildoers. We got the mind of the purple person going through the corridor. We got the mind of the helpers who are just good, sweet people. They're just going to, they're going to, oh, you poor thing. Let me take your hand. Tell me about it, you know. Man, you're, you have no clue that you've just crossed a line with God. And you think you, you brought God to that person because they wanted you to. And then you've got Adonai. Therefore, in Adonai's mind, Egypt and those who help her <clears throat> will be an intruder 
Egypt is an intruder into the things of God. And your and my little helpers, our little flesh petters, are not the saints that you think they are. And if you're one of them, you're not the saint you think you are because you're intruding on something that I, which which we will again we'll go through enough of Ezekiel to convince you and and after we get we're almost done with this but after we get through this first we'll just do a little section of of uh, Isaiah just to you know just to show you that it's not all directly related to the captivity or Babylon or da da da, da that God because Isaiah is way before Jeremiah and all that, that God is this way and that Adonai is this way. And he doesn't like that kind of stuff. This is his territory. If you're going to come in there, come in there trusting in Adonai to get you through. Don't, you know, well, you know, you can come in there and then call on somebody and everything, but you've, you've voided out the whole process and it's, you're no longer there anymore. You're just somebody that's going through uh, a crisis and you know man these eternal things you know eternal mm -hmm. moments lost um, <clears throat> so therefore in Adonai's mind Egypt and those who help with her will be an intruder and though they are mighty and should not lose this battle with Babylon by reason of their strength Yet, Judah's arm of the flesh, Egypt, shall be defeated and broken. And I've got all kind of scriptures here from Ezekiel and Jeremiah that'll show this, but we'll, we'll save all that to look at, at it later. <clears throat> um, uh, this, this was a, an important point in time. It was the convergence of the old school ruler Assyria and uh, those who, you know, were with them. And then Babylon was new on the scene. And so, uh, you know, I mean, if you can imagine, and I'll probably read something like that, but if you can imagine Judah going, we're just little... We're in between Assyria and, and Egypt and Babylon. I mean, we're right in the middle of all this stuff, you know, Battle of Armageddon. That's where it all comes. Um, we're, you know, we're just little here. And, and just, if you could just look at Pharaoh and he goes, you know what? We've got some power here and we've got some stuff and we're going to take care of this Babylon. We're going to help these folks. We're going to go, we're going to, you know, inter interject ourselves in the middle of something that God's trying to do in their life and see if we can't just destroy the whole thing and not just be in trouble with God ourselves, but mess up a person over here that is that if somebody had dealt with them rightly, they might have gone through this and glorified the father with the son and been a wonderful, wonderful eternal event now it's just going to be messed up on all sides i don't think i wrote all that down. <laughs> anyway um egypt should not meddle in god's dealings to make sons in his image egypt should not meddle in god's dealings of trying to make sons in his image and judah also will be punished yeah he will punish them for this. We go, well, yeah, those helpers, they, they need to get it. Well, you shouldn't have called them. Okay? You shouldn't have called them. What did it say? Though they will go, they will not go unpunished. Um, and Judah also will be punished, for she should not have called on something to circumvent his holy dealings. Little does Judah know that what Babylon brings is not a crisis from the enemy, the evildoer just attacking you. He's bringing, he is there as used of God, 
you, you know, during during that time period, okay, so this is all of all of Judah, all of God's people that are there uh, in the land of Israel, all of God's people that are there. Um, you really only get, I mean, that's that's speaking the truth. I mean, is Jeremiah. And you get Ezekiel too, but he's kind of already there. You get one man, or let's say, let's let's go ahead and make it. There are five. What there are five thousand that have not bowed their knees to to whatever. One main man that God points out that during this horrible thing was with me. But once this thing gets to Babylon, you got Daniel popping up, and you got the three Hebrew children, and you got you've got uh, actually you still got Esther, and you got a lot more that are you know you you that are going to know the Lord and be with the Lord and speak the word of the Lord and hear from the Lord. It's way more than when. Jeremiah was alone and nobody seemed to be in touch with his true heart and spirit and wanting that. And they were all resisting everything that would bring him to that. No, I don't want that. Why would I want that? That's horrible. That can't be of God. Well, and that, you know, and as many as us have ever said that, me included, um, uh, it's still true that God uses all. I mean, again, Esther is just one of the best pictures of all. And Mordecai, if you have believed that he was just a great man of God, uh, you need to read the first part very carefully of all the things that he does that says is against the commandment of the king because he's upset with how this is going. He's upset with this evil doer called Haman. And he's, he's you know, and we say, yeah, he's a righteous man. Look at him standing up for what? No, he's got to get, he... You know, Esther's the one who starts bowing down and getting to the king's heart. Mordecai tried and tried and tried through doing all these, pulling all this stuff and, and, and covering up for his reason that everybody's going to die. Covering up with sackcloth and ashes, no less. You know, it's just, it's a mess. We are a mess. Uh, if we don't know the heart of the Lord and the way the wor the Lord works, anyway, I just don't. I want to try to finish this part. Um, little does Judah know that what Babylon brings is not a crisis from the enemy, nor is Jehovah's first goal to be out to punish Judah. No, he is bringing them on holy ground. Doesn't look holy to them. Doesn't look, doesn't look holy. All is Adonai. Moving on their behalf in order to bring them to a closer fellowship with Christ crucified. And doing so for those who will have the right spirit in the midst of that. And little does Egypt know that this, know this either, nor do they realize the repercussions that will come on them for offering their help and strength to overthrow God's work in the one they came to save. All right, so you study historically and you study <clears throat> this, this convergence and you study Assyria up here and uh, you, you study uh, uh, Babylon over here and Egypt over here. <clears throat> and so there's this great, clash that happens about all about the same time and and uh, Assyria is defeated and will never rise to that level again Babylon wins and basically uh, Nebuchadnezzar becomes the ruler of the whole world <clears throat> but in that battle because it said Pharaoh Nico up there in that battle, 
Egypt's arms were broken, just like it says in Ezekiel. And they would never, ever, from that point on, you check it out. Carchemish, you check it out. They will never rise to the glory that they had before that. And all of that was prophesied in advance by Jeremiah and Ezekiel saying why it happened. All right. So, getting close to finish here. Um, <clears throat> so, little does Egypt know this either, nor do they realize the repercussions that will come on them for offering their help and strength to overthrow God's work in the one they came to save, Judah. My, my intentions were good. I meant well. I, you know, good intentions don't go anywhere with God. He's looking for his son in us. He wants his son in, in the helpers and in, in those who are going into the corridor and even in the evildoers. Even even First Peter shows some of the scriptures that he's even trying to reach them with his son, with his spirit. <clears throat> All right, so last paragraph. Remember in verse 10, he calls Egypt his enemies, but not because they are evil. Okay, that's important. Not because they are evil. Are they evil? I'm sure they are. So is Babylon. So is Judah. Extremely so. Because these guys, they're just going with what they've been raised in. Judah should have known the Lord and been with the Lord and known when you get into this sufferings, it's an opportunity to be with the Lord because the prophets knew that and they prophesied it. Where, where, where did I get that from? First Peter. Okay. <clears throat> and that's why they're saying, go, go with this. Don't fight it. Go with this. You're going... Oh, is that what that means? <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, remember in verse 10, ver um, he calls Egypt his enemies, but not because they are evil, though they are, for they look like they are being kind to the weak nation of Judah. But that weakness of Judah has been brought about by God and is necessary toward his greater purpose. As long as Egypt, as if being a kind friend, comes rushing in to fix things, they put themselves in the place of being God's enemy. They will experience one of the greatest catastrophic defeats in the Old Testament. And that's what I was telling about. Historically, it happened. And it was it's at this time and involving these nations. All right. So that's it. That's that's it. Um, let's see. Next week, Lord willing, um, we'll get into some verses in Isaiah <clears throat> that beautifully say this same thing for Israel over here, not Judah over here, Jeremiah and Judah, Israel over here. And Judah. And it will be the same story by another prophet who went before, who saw the Lord, who became a messenger of what he saw, and came just to deliver the heart of God, but it didn't sound too good to the evildoers or the helpers. And it didn't sound too good to to Judah either but it ended up being God and God's plan and God's working and you know anyway okay let's let's pray father we just love you and we thank you and father I believe that all of us probably have been guilty of various things within tonight sharing everything from being an evildoer to just standing there and accusing and even even saying things beyond what is the truth about someone and just tearing them down to 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 calling for helpers to help us to 
to we we say it father we just say oh i just need you to pray with me but father it becomes way more than that it becomes a violation of of the lamb who opened not his mouth and <clears throat> and um and father every aspect of this we've we've all failed it's not about the failures it's about lining up with you if we see our line has been running in a wrong wrong direction then we cry out to you and we say lord we want you we want to be with you where you're at not have you with me where i'm at because i'm not in a good place so we thank you for sharing with us we thank you for not holding back lest we stay in such a condition which would be contrary to the true heart that we have towards you to not stay in those places, but to ever be moving more toward you and to ever keep our eyes fixed, fastened, focused on your heart and your ways and your mind, which our ways are not your ways, and our mind is not your mind. Our thoughts are not your thoughts. But we can have your thoughts through being one with you, and not just something that happened 2,000 years ago oneness, but a today oneness. A today, Father and Instead of hearing your word, it'd be like it'd be like Jesus is in the driver's seat because we love him and we put him there and we're we're sitting up close to him, but then when he says something we scooch over toward our side and our window and cling. Father Jesus Jesus take the wheel. <laughs> Oh, Father, we do, we do mean it, Lord, and we seriously ask, not just, not just in the moment of a class or a prayer meeting, but in brought to mind in many moments during the day, a sweet desire to not be content with us, but to be satisfied with you more and more. You must, Jesus, increase. And Father, that was not the only stipulation. We must decrease. So we trust you. We're in your hands. We're in your hands. We are one with you. You did that. There's no way that you seek a theological oneness. Nor would any man who got married seek a theological oneness. So we want to be true to your heart. And we ask these things not just for ourselves or looking at any mistakes that we've made. We ask these things so that, Father, you'll get more of your Son, so that Jesus, as the Son in us, can glorify him more in this Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit may be released upon us in truth and in a way that he can speak the Spirit of truth and countermand any of our carnal thoughts that would arise. And we ask it humbly, peaceably, but truly, truly wanting in this way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there another class after this? Okay. Oh, there's a class. Okay. So, yeah, if you'll just stay on, don't, don't click off. Or, well, some of you may say, well, I've had enough of that. <laughs> but... Revelation, I don't know how long ago it was that I taught it, but 2012. 2012. 
uh, Deb said she was listening to one of them, and I was uh, s still struggling with my hernia, which about killed me. Um, and um, so it's been a while, but it's really this. That's that was the place, one place I wanted to go. The Book of Revelation is this same thing. It is this same thing that we we've been teaching and just particularly shared here. Um, so open your hearts, and um, and and if you you know I know everybody's busy, but don't rush off. I mean, go go to the bathroom, go do whatever you got to do. But if there's any way possible, this is a this is a really really good time for us to be with the Lord, for us to be together, for us to lay upon His bosom as as John did and say, I I just he go, why are you here? And I want to hear your heart. I want to hear your heart. So, anyway, I do love you, but Jesus loves you more. Amen. Bless you.